Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I'll be talking remotely with Brent Dodge. Mr. Dodge is a board certified orthopedic physical therapist. He also has additional training in manual physical therapy. Good day, Brent. Thanks for having me with you, Dr. Seacrest. Brent, what I thought we would talk about today is manipulation and physical therapy. I think a lot of people are, are used to seeing chiropractic physicians and osteopathic physicians who practice manual manipulation for things like back and neck pain. I, I think it's less common to see a physical therapist who uses these manual manipulated, manipulative therapies. Can you give me a little bit of an idea when physical therapy started using this type of therapy? Well, that's an excellent question, Dr. Seacrest, and I think it's important just to look at the history of, of manipulation or uh, man manipulative therapy in the United States to get an idea of when physical therapists really began using and uh, embracing manipulative therapy. Beginning in the late 1800s with uh, Andrew Still, we see the beginning of osteopathic approaches to manipulative therapy. Then in the late 1800s with uh, Daniel David Palmer, you have the beginning of chiropractic thought and approach. And so those guys kind of kick things off. And in the 1921, interestingly enough, you have the beginning of the American Physical Therapy Association. Uh, and shortly afterwards in 1921, there were 21 uh, journal articles in the physical therapy literature as well as book reviews on manipulation, including spinal manipulation. And notably, the first president of the American Physical Therapy Association, Mary McMillan, uh, wrote a number of treaties on approaches to physical therapy, including the four branches of physical therapy, one of which included manipulation of muscles and joints. So notably, uh, manipulation has been a part of the physical therapy practice since its very foundation. I think it took a while for it to really gain traction uh, really into the 1960s when you see the emergence of several international uh, leaders of manipulative therapy beginning with uh, Freddie Kaltenborn from Norway who we know now is the one who introduced what we think of as the Nordic approach. Uh, he wrote a treatise on uh, manipulative therapy, spinal manipulation in uh, 1964. Likewise, Jeffrey Maitland, an Australian physical therapist, uh, introduced uh, his school of thought, his approaches to manual and manipulative therapy, and wrote a book called Vertebral Manipulation that was published in 1964. Uh, Stanley Parrish is a name that's also well known. Uh, he was uh, born in New Zealand, was trained in Europe, brought a number of uh, approaches and theories in manual and manipulative therapy that uh, he taught uh, both professional and post-professional programs in manipulative and manual therapies. Uh, he started the St. Augustine School of uh, Medicine in St. Augustine, Florida, um, and, and a lot of his work continues as well. So I think as we look back, we see uh, the em embracement of manipulative therapy really from the foundation of the Physical Therapy Association, the beginning of our profession, and really taking hold with the emergence of several international leaders in the field. Uh, and to, you know, with ongoing and current literature, I think we're seeing a, a greater use by physical therapists of manipulative therapy, including spinal manipulation. Well, you know, I, th I think that's fascinating because I, I do think that, that um, you know, it's relatively uh, uncommon for me as a physician to actually refer a patient uh, to a physical therapist for manipulative therapy. So that little history lesson was, was definitely a, a, a brought it into perspective. A couple of questions though. One is, is, is there any difference between physical therapy is, or, or manipulation is practiced by a physical therapist and manipulation that might be practiced by a chiropractic physician or an osteopathic physician? Well, I do know that there's a lot of overlap uh, when, when I think of what I do as a physical therapist who uses manipulative approaches. Uh, thankfully, we've had the, you know, the fields of osteopathic medicine and chiropractic well in place uh, before the founding of the physical therapy profession. And I believe as a result of that, we've seen some overlap in, in the fact that we continue to uh, utilize a lot of the different techniques from both of those professions. Myself personally, a lot of my background has osteopathic roots. Um, 
not that the chiropractic approach isn't effective. I think a lot of times we're uh, maybe working toward a different end result, uh, but a lot of the times the manual approaches, the positioning, uh, the, the actual uh, implementation of the manipulation is, is very identical, very similar between the fields. Well, well let's talk a little bit about about how you actually make the decision when a patient would be appropriate for manual techniques. When, when, when you're seeing a patient, let's, let's limit it to low back pain for right now. If you're seeing a patient who presents to your physical therapy practice and he's been referred perhaps by a physician who has ordered physical therapy for maybe a first or second episode of low back pain, how do you make the choice whether this person is, is appropriate for manipulative therapy or whether you'll use some of the more common physical therapy modalities. I mean, for example, exercise, physical therapy, um, modalities such as TENS units, uh, ultrasound, those sorts of things. I use a, uh, a classification approach initially. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, physical therapy research into the arena of classification where if a person is presenting with uh, specific clinical findings, that person might be more appropriate to start with a physical therapy manipulation. That's not always the case with somebody that has low back pain. In fact, some people that present clinically may show that they have more of a loose joint rather than a tight joint and therefore might benefit more with a uh, stability training program to help stabilize uh, the joints uh, of the low back. In the classification system, what we've determined is that if we can identify a clinical prediction rule or findings that fit within a clinical prediction rule, uh, we would then have a greater likelihood of a very positive result with manipulation. For example, if somebody comes in with acute low back or a, a, an acute onset of a recurrent problem uh, and they come in within the first 16 days after the onset and they happen to have at least one level of tightness in the joints of the low back, which we test for, they have adequate hip range of motion, uh, they don't have pain that radiates below the level of one or more knee, uh, and they are, they're not classified as having a, uh, an aversion to activity, which we can also identify through various tests. That person, if they fit all of that criteria, would be an appropriate candidate and would expect a, a great result from uh, spinal manipulation. In fact, the, the literature would suggest about 94% or greater result. Uh, so you could really get somebody better quickly when they specifically fall within that clinical prediction rule. Well, that brings up another thing. What are you trying to accomplish with, with a manipulative technique? Um, what do you hope that uh, the patient's going to gain if you, if you do a manipulation on that first or second visit? Well, I think there's, uh, we sometimes underestimate it, but the fact that you are actually physically touching someone, there's a powerful element of touch where you're working with and positioning a person uh, by using your hands to position and actually treat that person. I think the second piece is that because the uh, uh, joint or set of joints is placed in such a position and there's a force that's placed through that joint or joints, uh, you get what we call a high velocity thrust, which can lead to very specific stretching. Sometimes you'll actually hear a pop. That's not always the case. I think it's better when you do, because then you know, there's even a psychological effect that, wow, I got a, a nice pop or a series of pops, and that seems to be healing and therapeutic to some people. Uh, but nevertheless, as that happens, you get a good stretching of the structures around the joint, what we call the periarticular structures. I think there's a, an improvement in nutrition and lubrication to the actual surfaces of the, the joint, uh, which can be healing. There's also movement, and movement can uh, send transmission of information along specific nerve fibers that can lead to a blocking of pain trans transi transmission as well as sort of resetting the nerve system and letting muscles relax, getting muscles spasm out, people begin to move more freely, and oftentimes they feel better, so they're then ready to move more quickly into an exercise-based program. Now, in, in terms of manipulative therapy, is, is this something you, you do once or twice and then move on to a, a, a more of a functional restoration program, an exercise-type program for low back? Or would you consider this something that you would do on multiple occasions, maybe even a, a long series of manipulations to try to maintain what you've gained on the first or second visit? 
You know, in my practice, it, when I get in, I get a manipulation. I, let's say I'm working at one level and I see some things really start to happen. The person's feeling better, is moving better. I start them on some exercises, whatever those might be, some form of core stabilization, possibly some flexibility work. Basically, when they come back, I'm going to recheck and just identify, is this uh, joint or set of joints now moving better? If not, we're certainly going to go back through, we'll, we'll, we'll make that manipulation again, uh, but it's not something I'm going to be doing over and over again. A lot of times we're going to see results with that. We're going to see improved joint mobility. We're going to see improved comfort, better, better ability to move, better ability to carry out daily activities and exercises. And in those cases, we're really going to then start a focused exercise program. We're going to be educating that client on how the back and how the body works so that they can uh, protect their spine and really start getting back to their activities, whether that be regular activities, uh, getting back to a specific job, whatever the case might be, but it's not generally a long term, you know, I'm just going to keep adjusting or manipulating the same joint over and over again. So what do you do to follow that up after you've had that success with the manipulation? What sort of therapy are you going to shift to at that point? I'm going to be really interested in, in looking at the person as a whole in terms of how they're moving, their body mechanics. I'm going to be making sure that they're able to learn how to protect their spine through proper uh, muscle work, stabilization work, the way they move, the way they push, pull, lift, uh, so that they can really protect their back and keep it healthy for the years ahead. Uh, it may be that they've got some flexibility or muscle imbalances where something's weak, maybe something's tight. We'll be isolating and, and really working on a specific muscle or group of muscles for strengthening purposes while maybe simultaneously working on flexibility to make sure that we can correct that muscle imbalance and hopefully protect that problem from recurring. Well, this is interesting information. I guess one of the things that I would like to sort of discuss as well, and that is the downsides of manipulation. Do you feel that there are any times where manipulation would, would not necessarily be the right thing for this patient and could potentially cause harm? Well, I certainly think that, you know, somebody that comes in with acute back pain that has specific levels of tightness in the low back, there's no real nerve signs or symptoms. In other words, there's no pain that's traveling down below the level of the knee. There's no uh, muscle weakness when we go through and specifically test the muscles of the, the low back, the abdominal area, and the lower limbs. Um, they're not complaining about any type of, of uh, strange symptoms such as anything with bowel or bladder, particularly any numbness in, in what we what we'd think of as the saddle area where they might contact if they were sitting on a saddle. Those are things that might suggest, you know, there may be more going on, particularly with the nerve system, what we call neurogenic pain, uh, that would lead us to possibly, you know, rethink whether we want to do a manipulation. And I'm, I would probably err as a clinician on the side of, of caution. Um, I don't have to rush into that. There's a lot of other tools that I have to use as a physical therapist while monitoring those neurogenic symptoms. Um, because I think if, if we get into a, a, an acute disc problem where somebody's got some, some very acute nerve signs and symptoms, that person's likely not going to respond in a favorable sense to spinal manipulation. Well, what sort of training uh, do physical therapists need to actually practice manual physical therapy? I think you mentioned that it's been a part of the physical therapist training for a long time, but you obviously have additional credentials in manual physical therapy. Um, it, is this sort of treatment something that we can expect any physical therapist to be able to provide? If, if we go to a physical therapist, uh, should we expect that physical therapist to be able to, to do a manipulation or not? I would like to think so, Dr. Seacreast, uh, but the reality is, as we've looked at our uh, training programs, our degreed programs in physical therapy, let's say even over the last 20 years, I graduated in 1991, uh, manipulative therapy was not part of the curriculum at, the, at that time, and I did not come out of my professional program uh, with the skills or knowledge to do spinal manipulation. Uh, that was uh, additional learning that I took on through uh, the North American Institute of Orthopedic Manual Therapy uh, and really spent a lot of time. We would do five, six day courses. We'd return each year. We would do uh, lots of testing and, and uh, practicums, which ultimately la led to a certification as a manual physical therapist that in fact was doing manipulative procedures. 
Uh, I think there's, there's other schools now that as we see physical therapists embracing more and more uh, the value of manipulation and particularly as we've seen the evidence uh, in today's literature as that body of knowledge continues to grow, uh, there has been a movement in, in the, what are now all doctoral programs for physical therapists to embrace that and to learn that as part of their uh, professional curricula. And I, I think more and more we're seeing those people come out of their programs ready to go, ready to manipulate. Um, so I'm thinking in these days, this should be something that, that we would expect of our entry level physical therapists, um, that, that they would be ready to roll in terms of, of providing that type of care. Well, it, it, that brings up an interesting point, and, and that is if, if I'm looking for a physical therapist to provide manual physical therapy, what should I look for either as a physician who is referring patients for manual physical therapy or if I'm a patient looking for a physical therapist that could provide this type of care? What sort of certification should I look for? Well, first of all, I, I think it would be helpful for anyone who's looking to utilize physical therapy services, where, whether a physician looking for a, uh, a person that does, you know, a physical therapist that does manipulation, that there be some, you know, either a phone call or a conversation, uh, getting on the internet looking for a potential uh, CV, resume of that physical therapist to see what their background is, or simply to ask the person, you know, what their background is, what their training is. And some physical therapists, I think, would tell you, well, I'm not, I don't do manipulative therapies, and, you know, that's fine. Hopefully that changes as we, we see the evidence grow and people become more comfortable with that uh, valuable approach. But I guess the thing to do would be to seek it out and really ask people what they've gone through, what they've done. Do they do it routinely? Is this, is this fly by night or is this somebody that really uh, has embraced and utilizes this every day in the clinic? Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and that is to ask your personal opinion because you obviously are a physical therapist that practiced for many years without using manual physical therapy, and now you, you've received this extra training. You're now using it. What's the difference that it's made in your practice? I can't live without it, and I can tell you that my results are far superior than anything I ever used to use. Part of that, Dr. Seacrease, is just, you know, I think for someone that's been out doing this for 20 years, you've got an eye for when it's going to work. You've, you've, you've looked at the literature. You know what the clinical prediction rule is. Uh, you've had your hands on a lot of people's spines and, and felt where, you know, things are tight, where things are loose. And having begun to manipulate, you know, basically in the mid-90s and really getting on board in, in 2000 and beyond with some of my advanced training, uh, I've seen the results that are far superior, particularly as it re re relates to uh, neck, upper cervical, uh, situations like that, but particularly as we mentioned before with low back pain, when we get the right patient that's classified correctly, that person uh, can get stellar results with manipulative therapy, and I think it would be a disservice not for those people to have access to that level of care. Well, I think, I think it's very interesting information, and, and I appreciate you joining us today to, to sort of explain this to patients. Is there anything we haven't discussed as we close that you think patients should know about either physical therapy in general or manipulative physical therapy? Well, first of all, I think the general public in a, in a lot of cases, now I give them credit because I think there's a lot more awareness now about what physical therapists can do, about the value of manipulative therapy, uh, yet I still think there's a lot of people who get the idea that pain is a natural process that, you know, when it, particularly as you age, that, you know, you should just kind of expect that things are going to hurt, things aren't going to work properly and they just sort of amortize their, their symptoms as something is being normal into their lifestyle. And I would just really encourage people to realize that the, the human body is made to move. Uh, it's made to function. If something's not working right, it could be that there's some physical therapy or other manipulative therapy that could, could make a huge impact on how you feel, how you feel when you get up in the morning, what it's like when you go to work, you know, not coming home with a headache. There's just so many ways that I think people who are doing manual therapy, you know, particularly with those who have an interest in, you know, a specific therapeutic exercise and training people, teaching them how to take care of themselves, how to take a leg up on being healthy. And that means not having pain because I think if pain's there. It's your body telling you, hey, there's something going on. Yeah, there's a lot of technology and treatment out there that can really help people these days. Well, thanks for that advice. I think that's excellent advice. And I think, uh, you know, all of us have heard the, heard the term or the 
the saying, use it or lose it. And I think pretty much that sums up what you just told us. Yeah, I, I agree. Thanks for joining us today, Brent. Thank you for having me, Dr. Seacrest.